So uh, I'm, I'm just going to make a quick introduction. I'm an architect, that I'm an artist, and that I moved to Guanajuato um, maybe two years ago after living in Mexico City, after uh, studying a master's degree in Italy, I realized that Mexico City was a bit too big for me at the moment. Um, and I think, I don't know, I relate to the theme that we're going to see today, and I relate to Escher because he kind of felt the same. Um, he was born in Holland and then moved to Italy, and then his world changed. So I kind of feel this way. And um, other than that, I started with him because this is, of course, one of a series of many artists that I want to cover during 2021. And I've given classes on, on some other more, uh, more known artists. Not many people outside of the design and geometrical world actually know him. And I wanted to start with him, not only because I relate as an architect, but also because his work is so um, full of surprises. There are many things that we don't know about him that could make him more interesting than making, I don't know, a, a, first, a first class um, Picasso, right? So I believe that when we talk about Escher, there is a whole aura of um, mystery about his life because he was so into his private life and his family. He tried actually not to be famous. It is said that he was several times approached by other artists, by even I think Mick Jagger called him once to, to ask him if he could um, design something for a cover and MC Escher actually responded, no thank you and you cannot call me Maritz, please call me MC Escher. He made efforts to not be known. He tried all his life to give his art at a, at a tremendous price to deter the audience and people kept buying. So this is a story of how someone actually wants to make something for really truly himself and nobody else and failing that. <laughs> so we're gonna start first with some of his earliest works. And when I say earliest is really, really early maybe even before he started architectural school, because his father, as a civil engineer, um, he traveled a lot and brought from Japan many of the block prints and many of the, the, the prints. And Escher was, <coughs> I'm sorry, and Escher was inspired by them even since he was a very small child. But of course, his, parent, his parents would have never liked him to be an artist. We know that many parents don't want artists to be artists until they become famous. And they say, oh, I always supported my child. But it was not the case because after all, Escher came from a family with a lot of money. So we're going to see that most of what we actually see today was made... Um, was made a reality thanks to his parents' money. So even he, when he was already a grown man, he was still getting economical support from his parents, even though his art was already making something, right? So we're going to start with his very first block printings and posters. He tried to be graphic in a sense of graphic designer at first because he was born in 1898 so the turn of the century he comes to to harlem to the city to to study architecture and he receives like mm, not such good grades and not such good um enthusiasm from his teachers he has one teacher in particular samuel de mesquita who is really a fan of his graphic work. He's a fan of, his, of the work he does in his art class. Because even in his art class, he's already understanding how block printing works. So once uh, the Mesquita says, you know, you're really good at this. You should just 
change lanes, you should stop architecture and be an artist. And he didn't say it in a mean way, you know, when you, they tell you these stories of, oh, you just go do something else. You're not born for this. It wasn't like that. He, he said, you're really, truly talented as an artist. You have to leave architecture. And so his father uh, reluctantly accepts and he um, leaves architecture. And, but he never really truly goes and studies arts. He uh, starts using his time to invest in his time to learn to use the block printing, the linoleum printing, and even the lithography. Mm, we can see here, for example, a bit of what made Escher Escher, not only his childhood, because he will always talk about um, childhood of freedom, as you would see uh, in a family with a lot of money, right? Uh, uh, a childhood of freedom and of experimenting and of trouble and of being one of four siblings, being the only one that became an artist because the other three of them are um, scientists. In fact, he once said something like, I was saved by a hair of becoming a useful member of society. Of course, he was joking because being an artist is a very, being a useful member of society, but it was his approach towards a family of scientists and a family of business makers. So we can see here that um, when he was very, very young, he travels and in one of those travels, he get to know Jetta, who will become his, uh, his wife. Uh, Jetta is also from a family with money, and um, they meet in Italy, in Ravello, in one of their travels, and they just keep sending letters to each other until they marry four years later and move to Italy. Now, this is, yes, a romantic story, but also we have to consider that it is not the perfect love story, and it will, it will uh, become a big part of who Escher is, because he, she will live with him most of his life. Uh, I won't ruin the story of what we'll see in a couple of slides, but they separate after a while, because you can see, for example, this, um, this piece of art is from 1958. So it's already pretty late in his career, but even when they think of separating, he will always feel this bond of union he will always feel like they were made for each other. What he said is we were made for each other. That doesn't mean that we were perfectly happy the whole time. But part of this was because as many artists and creatives, um, Escher was a workaholic. So he would spend long, long uh, periods of time in his studio. Um, there are some interviews with his children and his children, his um, eldest son, saying things like, I was very happy as a child growing up in Rome. Um, but I do remember, uh, for example, not seeing my father for five days. And we would just leave him the food around for him to grab whenever he wanted. And, um, but when he was around, Escher was for what they say, an amazing father. So what he said is, my father was inquisitive and he, was, um, he wanted us to experience the world as weirdly as he did. And then what would happen is that Escher would get an idea and, and he would just become all on himself trying to figure out this idea. And until he was able to unravel this and actually put it on paper and put it on wood, then he would start speaking to the world again. But in these first years, um, Escher didn't really found, uh, find his passion of what later would be his geometrical work. In these first years, um, Escher would try to put, put the world that he saw on paper and also trying to um, discover some ideas from things that he already knew. So what Escher said was, I, I paint and I draw and I 
and I blo do blog prints of things that I want to understand, things that I already know. So for example, if I read the Bible, I want to make images from that to actually understand them. And that is why he, one of his very first series is the days of the creation. The first day of the creation, the second day of the creation. And these all come from stories from the Bible where he tries to tell the story that someone else already told. But, and this is the thing that they are graphically really good and they probably took a lot of time and a lot of work, but it is still something that comes from something else. So if, for example, if this was all the art we knew from Escher, it would still be good art, but he wouldn't be famous. This is what really made him famous. And this was the very first time that he did it. This is 1922. He was still in architectural school, but he was already working on the ideas of the regular division of the plane that will become his biggest work. Uh, in this theory, what he's saying is any plane can be considered illimited. Any plane can replicate to infinity if we find uh, a pairing of geometrical figures that border each other in a certain way and that can basically repeat themselves until the end of time if we have enough paper. So this is the first time that he does this. He does it in a small wooden block. So to actually achieve this, that is quite a small print, he has to print it, print it uh, I think, four times. So, and it's also a matter of great precision because let's say, and I don't know if some of you here have actually worked on a block print that is repeated, but let's say you print once, then when you have to, to print the second piece, you have to actually match it perfectly as to not overlap the images. And maybe later on when we take a class on Impressionism and what came before the Japanese, who were actually the first ones to, to work on this process, we will see how important it was to have this precision, because if this was printed four times, there are some uh, block prints that need 50 prints. So imagine that you mess up the, the, the print number 50. So you already spent a day trying to, um, to reproduce the rest of it. This is a, in this first, um, in this first work that is titled Eight Heads, we see that he is still working with the basis of uh, regular forms. But there are also other works that he's doing while he lives in Italy. And the thing is that I'll pass through these works a bit quickly because they don't represent what he, who he became. But if we actually see them with detail, we see that he was already thinking of layers of reality. So what they say is that Italy gave him two things that are opposed to each other. One is Italy gave him the inspiration to work on art every single day because he was really inspired by the landscapes. But two, it also gave him the opposite, the the, 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 the point that he was so inspired and so surrounded by so much beauty that he was kind of blocked to create a thing of his own. So he spent most of his years in Italy only reproducing what he saw. Also, it is not that much truth because he, he really represented what he saw, but he also tried to exaggerate it. So what happens if I have a hill or a mountain and I make it a steep? What happens if I have some um, bolts and columns and I reproduce them to infinity? So it is not true. I mean, he was actually already trying to represent different layers of reality. And it's also, for example, in this uh, print of Tunisia, you can also see which is very interesting how he's working on degrading the ink. So it's not only a matter of, oh, I just work with black and white. He will eventually <laughs> work on several colors. He will work on uh, how to degrade the tones from black to white. And all these experiments, they take time. So we, 
we see here a bit more than 10 years of um, Escher analyzing every single thing that surrounds him. I put this one not because it makes any difference in his career, because, but because I actually like the way he saw life. So, for example, they tell the story that there were these kids that um, played him a prank, trying to get him into one of these chapels with mummified priests, trying to... Um, that is... <laughs> trying to um, make him scared. And he just took the time to actually sit there and draw them. <laughs> so it is interesting how when you want to draw reality, you just draw and draw and draw and never stop. But we see this small um, development of his work from reality to start being a bit more imaginative. So we start seeing, for example, chapels that are very well architecturally developed, but with a certain level of imagination. And he always talked about this discovery and wonder. And even if we, when he's um, drawing things that are very close to reality, what he says is that, he, first of all, he liked to go to places where no tourist went. So places that maybe were very difficult to access with a car. So he would go very high up the mountain by foot. And also, even if you go and stand in the very same places where he stood, you can see that the, the landscape were not as dramatic. They were not as steep. They were not as, um, as closed, for example. So he actually tried to, to, to make this effect. He tried to make this landscape even more dramatic than they were. But these, all these that we've seen till now, it is still a low profile artist. Here is a point where we make the jump to when he became a master of his art. And this is when he goes to Spain. He had gone to Spain, he had gone to Spain um, in 1922 some eight years before, but, you know, with his parents as a tourist, uh, he had found it fascinating, but nothing more. And then in the 36, he goes to the Alhambra again, uh, to Granada. And he finds, he finds something that is quite uh, impressive. And that is the way that uh, the Moorish architecture delivers a space is covered in graphic designs. But the thing is that he understood you know, that the Moorish just couldn't represent um, living creatures in their designs. But he could. He said, okay, I, I don't have this religion, so I can make this a reality. This is, of course, a copy, exact copy he made standing there. And you can see how perfectly represented it, it was. So what the experts say is you realize that we just maybe a ruler or a couple of very simple um, objects. He was able to understand and represent a very complex geometry. So what they say is things that scientists have worked to understand for many, many years, he understood them uh, intuitively. And he actually said this many times, like they want me to go and give a lecture to mathematicians. And I don't want to do that because I don't understand what they are trying to talk about. And they are talking of algorithms and they are talking about um, progressions of numbers and Fibonacci numbers. And for me, it's just intuition and forms and how I can uh, weave them together. And so, he makes all of these sketches of all the different iterations of graphic designs that he sees in the Alhambra. And this will eventually become his very famous tessellations. So this is something that he will work on forever in his life. We won't um, repeat it too much because he made hundreds of these. But it is a very important, maybe the most important part of his development, the, the, the way he understands how tessellations work, how they can reproduce to infinity, 
how the forms actually match each other. And most importantly, I think, is the point that they complement each other. So if you see one figure or a figure of certain color, then you can't see the others because one is always the background for the first one. So this is the moment where we see actually new direction in his work. And he actually represents this in one single piece. The, the, the metamorphosis piece, the first one, represents actually the change in his brain and in his world, saying, okay, I have this landscape, this Italian landscape, I've been drawing that for many years, and now I, Escher, can feel myself changing and can feel myself becoming something else. So these, these two pieces are the representation of that change of mind. And basically, this mindset change represents everything. So he will still be uh, drawing some of the architecture that we've seen before, but more and more, he will start being more dramatic. He will start being more um, enthused about the changes in light and shadow. And he even once, he said, um, I never really liked Rome. He lived in Rome for 13 years. And there he had his uh, two of his three children. But he said, I never really liked Rome because Rome is boring. I like just the Moorish style of architecture in Italy. And I like the south of Italy. But actually, Rome is boring and too... Um, elegant for my taste but he would make a couple of works of saint peter and some other specific spaces like the colonnade of bernini that is outside saint peter but we can see here for example this is 1934 and this is 10 years later around 10 years later and we can see that he's always inspired by these architectural themes but how he starts to develop it and change it and still into something that is not too understandable as if he was trying to understand how graphics actually work like paper folding but this is of course a development in the life of an artist right trying to figure out reality and then trying to figure out how to unfold that reality until it becomes something completely mental imagery this is what I consider to be the first of his works that actually uh, represent this jump into more than one world, because this is the very first time that he actually tries to represent uh, and succeeds in representing uh, reflection. Later on, he will do even better because we will see um, the actual surface of the mirror. But right now, this is the very first time that we actually see three planes. The first is the objects that surround the scene. And they were actually things uh, that he used. And they, they were things that actually existed. The second one would be the mirror. And the third one would be the things that are inside the mirror that now we know are behind us. So this would be the street, right? And these were all works that he did at the same time that he kept going with these landscapes. And, um, but eventually he starts working with the reflection in a very much more interesting way, in a way that actually um, surrounds us and where we actually feel like when we see a piece of Escher, we are surrounded by it and we basically see the whole world that he's living. So here we see the same, right? The same three levels of reality. The objects that surround the, the, the mirror, then the mirror itself, and then the, the world that is around us, the window and he himself working on the prints. And his son used to say that he actually liked these, uh, these prints not because they are impressive in any way, but because they remind him him of his childhood and his home because they, these were objects that were laying around in his house and these were good representation of 
the rooms in his house. So he says that whenever he's feeling like homesick, of course, this person is now like 80 years old. But he says, whenever I want to, re to recover and remember my childhood, I look at one of these prints because I know that it will represent a, a room or a studio or a kitchen in my home. We can see here the dump in quality of his work, right? Like it, 1921 to 1934. And we already see all these drastic difference between the, the simple reflection that he tried and the very, very complex uh, still life with a spherical mirror that he created. And so after all these experiments with the sp spherical figures, we come to probably his most uh, known self-portrait. I think he made more than 60 self-portraits. This is one of them, the most famous. What is very interesting is first that it was so used for pop art references. He became almost the king of psychedelic art, starting with this, um, with this piece. And so people in the 60s and people in the 70s and the hippies were all trying to, to get the, the copyright for this work because, you know, there are references in almost every, um, almost in every little thing of our culture from the 90s has this piece as a reference. But what he actually said is, it's interesting that you get the sense that if you turn the sphere, your face, or in this case, my face, Escher, uh, will always be in the center. So this will always be the center of my world. And you can see, for example, this is a studio that, that I was saying that is exactly um, his studio with the art that he had with a, a mantelpiece here and a, a tube of a chimney coming down on this side, sorry, where he could actually lift a lid and call to his family in the kitchen so they could bring the food up. And he replicates or tries to replicate this uh, idea of the still life with the street in a much more... Um, successful way. So you can see that, that there is a great, great deal of detail, for example, here with the cards. And then you don't actually know when it starts, wh where the still life finishes and the street starts. I don't know if you felt the same, but the first time that I saw this piece, I actually just thought that it was, for example, a still life on a ledge of a window and then a street. And then the second time that I saw it, I realized, oh no, this is the table itself. This is already a book here. So the book is actually laying onto the, onto the building. So it's basically one and the same. The, the, the mantle and the table is like an enormous, enormous pieces lying on the street. Here are some other examples of what he kept working on the tessellations on and the fact that he was always trying to represent living things. So how, uh, for example, in this case, um, dogs and fish, they all move towards the same direction, but one creates the other and vice versa. So yes, the difference is that in one, um, one of them cannot exist without the other. And like these, we can go on and on and on about the metamorphosis, uh, many options that, that he actually did and designed. And some of them are even uh, replicated in murals and in, in university tiles and this kind of very graphic. This is why so many people wanted his work on book covers and CD covers. And this is one of my favorites of the way he actually joined both worlds. How he joined the, this idea of the division of the plane that he was working on. And at the same time, 
he um, represented his beloved landscapes because he knew that the landscapes didn't really have the same impact in people, but he loved them. So he would never stop doing them. And even more so, he would try to merge them into what people were actually intrigued about. Here we can see, for example, and he was not left uh, without humor. Um, Escher was a person that had a lot of humor in him. So he kept always writing about the ideas that he developed because, of course, we see a final piece, but these pieces, they all took a lot of work and a lot of sketching in his notebooks and a lot of um, development of concepts. So here he's saying, I don't only have the presentation of the infinite um, division of the plane, but I also have the presentation of levels of reality. I also have the presentation of leaving things in, leaving things um, that get into the world of the drawing. So in this case, he just says, you know, there were these reptiles that were bored out of their mind because they were flat. And so they decided to free themselves and go explore. And this um, concept actually comes to life even more vividly in this piece that is called Encounter. So this is the encounter of an optimistic and a pessimistic. And what he's saying is, if we see this piece of art in its flat format, we realize that we, they will never meet eye to eye in anything that they say, because you can never see both of them at once. But if I take them out of the flat paper and I make them three-dimensional, then eventually they can shake hands. So this is, for me, it's a very, one of the, the most significant works of his career because he's, he was always saying, I try for my art to be completely free of social message. I want my art to be purely geometrical. I want it to be free of political message, but uh, there was a limit to this. And eventually he made this piece almost uh, at the end of the war. Because what I skipped about, I started talking about his art a lot, but I stopped talking about his life a little bit. So what happened with Escher was that he would have lived in Italy forever, but then Mussolini arrived and he realized that he couldn't live with his um, children going to school that would require them to wear a certain type of uniform. And he was not Jewish, but of course he cared for his Jewish friends. So he decided to move to Switzerland. And eventually when he moved to country to country, eventually um, his, their teacher, the Mesquita, was taken into a concentration camp. So this hit him really hard and his art, even when he tried to make it non-political, it just, it is what it is. You can't, you can't ignore your reality, right? But in these times that he was out of Italy, but also out of big cities because it, it was, it, there were difficult times, he went into a mental retreat. What, what happened was that when he moved, he realized that he was out of inspiration. He said, I have moved to places that have a lot of beauty, that have nature, that have uh, snow, but this gives me nothing. The architecture of the places where I live, it gives me nothing. I don't feel the inspiration to actually um, paint anything or draw anything. And he starts for the first time working in a more internal way. This is, as always, I, I like to pair these two works because they both work with the concept of three worlds. So you see three spheres, three spheres, sorry, that are um, transforming each other. And you also see three worlds, the world below the water, the world in the surface of the water, and the world of the reflection. So this is like a very this is something that we see every day, right? This is a scene that we may see every day, but we don't ever really truly see it as the three worlds that Escher saw.
And this concept of three will repeat itself uh, more or less forever in his work too. So he made these spheres that would actually seem like a simple uh, project of his, but it's actually an interesting one because you can see that the three spheres have different materials. So you can see one that is opaque, you can see one that is completely transparent, and you can see one that is um, mirror-like. So you see him again, and we will see him again and again in his work. And this same um, concept of the concave and the convex, he works on it um, ad nauseum. So what he's saying is, for example, in this one that is called the balcony, I am just so bored of the paper being flat. So I just try and hit the paper in the back, punch it in the back to see how this transforms the image. And now we can see that the balcony is four times bigger than the rest of the balconies. Eventually, he starts working with not only with uh, like eye bending tricks, but he also starts working with perspective and the concept of infinity and the concept of the impossible. So he's working with um, simultaneous perspectives. At the same time, we see the same bird that actually we saw in one of the spherical still lives, right? So we see that this is an object that he appreciated very much and that it existed in his home. He starts working on the impossible unfolding of space. And I put three different versions, or at least assume in a color version, so you can actually see the whole detail of it. Because we see, if we see only the original one, that is the central one, in black and white, we understand the, the perspectives, the change in perspectives, the change in geometry, but we don't um, see all the details that he was actually trying to show us. The, the, the color version helps us understand the bending of the perspectives, and the detail helps us understand how the floor is in fact the ceiling, or is it the floor? So these are the type of works that you can actually um, see forever. You, I can stare at these pieces for a good 20 minutes and see piece by piece how it um, unfolds. This is probably one of the most repro reproduced <laughs> works of Azure. Mm. And it basically only talks of the idea of what is real, because he will keep saying this over and over again to the people who question him. Because at this point, um, 1948, at this point he was already pretty famous. So people would be asking all the time for him to give lectures. They would ask him um, if he could write books. He was a book illustrator, but he was not a book writer. He was a draftsman. And he enjoyed being alone. So he said, all I can do to explain all of this is actually make more work. So don't ask me to explain myself. I will just make more work. You will see it. And hopefully you will understand. This is him working, not precisely on this piece, but working on one of his many geometrical shapes. Uh, I find it really impressive because these are, is basically the development of the concept of the, of the impossible worlds and the worlds that clash among each other, right? And also the fact that he's trying to animate concepts that were inanimate. For example, when he's having a conversation with one of the scientists and the scientist is saying, you know, there are only 14 types of possible crystal um, developments in water. There are only 14 forms, and every time a crystal starts forming, it will take the form of one of these uh, possible geometries. And at least in history, there hasn't been any more discovered. So he takes, he's very interested in this, he takes the idea of the crystals and try to animate them for people to understand it in a more human way, other than, you know, the the books of the scientists. This is a very important work, the one in the 
in the right because it doesn't show only the reproduction of a form or yes, the, the development of one single form, but it is the representation of as many forms as he can get, always within a mathematical read. So what they say is that if you see these um, originals up close, you will see in some of them still the lines that guided him. So in all this chaos of in all these animals and imaginary creatures, you can actually see the order in the chaos. And oh, I didn't plan for that to go that way, but now we talk about chaos. So um, for example, in this case, he's actually saying that we adore chaos because we love making order. So what he's saying is when you ask me to make something orderly, it's very easy. What is very, very difficult is to represent chaos because chaos means that I just have to be random and what I hate most is being random. So he tries to clash these two worlds that, that are very conflicting in his mind, making something that is very orderly versus something that is very much um, chaotic. Many of the works of Escher are not only representations of what he wanted to make, but he was also, for money, making a lot of graphic design. The interesting thing is that, well, he worked in a lot of posters, he made a lot of, for example, um, logos, he made any type of work, graphic design for merchandise. But what is interesting is that more so than not, he would start developing a char character for these works that would eventually become something else. So in this curl up um, print, he develops a character that can basically walk with human feet or cool up and move as an animal. And eventually this, this character that was made for a graphic commission became part of his work as an artist. And it is a really interesting kind of, it makes me kind of nervous really, but it really shows you all the possible levels up and down and what is, what is up and down and out and in. For example, in many cases he says, okay, one single print takes me a day because it requires maybe 20 plates to be assembled and to be printed one after the other. So it is not only a matter of him understanding how space um, unravels and develops, but also how he understood what came before what, how, how he had to manage um, the ink and the paper as to not to, to ruin a piece that take many, many days and hours. And of course, at the end of his life, he would then be criticized because he would make a lot of reproductions. Because, I mean, if you're a uh, block printer, then you take a lot of time making prints of work that you've already done before. But of course, as he got older, he was having difficulties um, having the precision to make the incisions in the wood. So he would start making reproductions of what of the many things that he did in years past. Now, this is one of my very favorite, I think I've said that like five times, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he works a lot with the, with the idea of relativity. We have to consider that these are the years in which Einstein is working on his own concepts of relativity. And also uh, Sigmund Freud is working on relativity and the mind. So uh, even Einstein once said that it is understandable that everybody wants to represent relativity. I don't know why they want to do this. Relativity is something that cannot be represented, but I'll just let them try. So um, Escher takes his, his, his shot at this, and he also understands that this is a world that he has to, yes or yes, he has to uh, share with mathematicians. So we see him uh, becoming friends 
of two very important people in the world of mathematics. One that we will see a little bit um, later, that is Roger Penrose. And this, uh, this person here, who is the um, Coxeter, the, the big mathematician Coxeter, who basically worked all his life in the development of whatever Escher was doing in the world of the arts, he was trying to develop in the world of science and math. This is, I just put this so you could laugh at me. I made this in a school many, many, many years ago, trying to turn this uh, relativity piece of art into a set that people could actually use in theater. So of course I failed at that. And uh, also Escher was becoming more and more anxious. He put in a letter that for example, this piece that it was making him anxious because he, when he saw it after many months of seeing it, he couldn't really understand anymore if this piece was convex or it was concave, what parts were actually concave and which, which parts were actually convex. So he had to call a friend and send, and send him this and tell him, can you please tell me which parts are what? Because I'm already confused after all this mind-bending work. So this will come uh, more and more into his work, all this geometrical development of the spaces. And we see, for example, the print gallery that is very, very interesting because it, is, it actually demonstrates one of the points of how you can make any image that you have, you can make it Escher-esque. So th what they are saying is that, oh well, before let me give you the introduction to this. This is the Drostas effect, that effect in which you are in an image that is in an image that is in another image. It is called the Drost effect because it was used for the first time in a cocoa powder in Holland. So you see that there is a nun, and then the nun is in the cocoa, um, and when you see the small cocoa, then you see another nun, but this is the thing that will have actually developed, how you can bend the greed and how this greed has to be much more complex than you would think to, to achieve what he actually did in an intuitive way. So he was a genius of the geometries because he basically understood this in an intuitive way. And when he starts working with all these mathematicians, he works with the sense of the infinity. So how can I not only develop and repeat one image many, many times, but also how can they become bigger or smaller? Okay, one another example of the way he worked with impossible geometries and in and out. And he always has these little um, characters and, and glimpses into his analysis of the mathematics. And, and one of his characters is always thinking, how can this be possible? This is uh, a print that he gifted Penrose, where you can see that fishes become scales and the scales of those fishes become other fishes. So it's always a loop. Some other works that he, he did with mathematics and the work of Donald Coxeter. Donald Coxeter had this mathematical representation of infinity. And what Escher did was, yes, I see your work Coxeter. It's very interesting, but how can I actually make it beautiful? So this is his first representation of the Coxeter um, mathematical representation. And then he says, how, how can I get it to be more and more and more complex? So yes, Coxeter says, why do you always ask me why I do what I do? No one asks the artist why they do what they do. So I have the same obsession and the, the, the obsession that I have is shapes and forms. And Escher says, okay, I enjoy also the same type of obsession. So how can we make what you're studying how can we make it beautiful? 
And so this will go on and on into representations of living things, in this case, angels and demons. And in the way he gets to the very limit, you can see that there is a lot of detail even to the edge of the, of the circle. <laughs> of the circle, he's trying to represent these hyperbolic geometries that Coxeter developed in mathematics. So he will be sending these to Coxeter and to Penrose, and then they will write back with some new theories saying, like as a challenge, right? Like, Escher, here is some new mathematical development. What do you think of this? What could you do with this? So this is Roger Penrose, who was the um, mathematician who developed the Penrose stairs. Maybe you've seen the Penrose stairs in... Um, movies they've been used for example in inception and it is a representation of the ever going stairs the that you always go up or you always go down and how how they have been trying to represent these stairs in the physical model and how it's something that is only a graphic a graphic thing that cannot be reproduced um, in the real world. The same case with the Penrose Triangle. So um, Roger Penrose would do this. He would publish it in a mathematical study or in a ma mathematical diary, or he would send it to Escher, and Escher would respond with something like this. So Roger Penrose is actually still alive. He gives classes in Oxford, and he um, owns several of the original and signed and uh, pieces of art by M.C. Escher, so he's become pretty famous. And you can see here the father of Roger Penrose showing uh, the triangle to Picasso, and Picasso saying, man, you should be cubists, not mathematicians. I mean, so this was the very last print that he ever made. And we can see that he will always try to develop the, the, the ideas of infinity, the ideas of the reproduction of forms. You can see him here making a mural, and you can see the, <clears throat> the lines that helped him, right? But it was something that required a lot of, a lot of detail. And... That's it, guys. Thank, you guys. thank you so much for being here. I, I started with him, with him because he really, really tried for the impossible, more so than other artists, I think. He was um, an example for whoever wants to, to carve a creative living. Even if, uh, even if you're not an artist, you will always be creating. So I think he's a great example. And in case you want to see more of this in the future, I uh, invite you to check out my patron. Here are some of the artists that I think I might make some classes on. But of course, I always take into consideration what people want to learn. So I would be starting in January with Marc Chagall, Helen Frankenthaler, probably talking a bit of... Um, Abstract Expressionism, David Hockney and the UK Art, uh, Ilma Klimt, and, um, and there are just several tires of what you can choose depending on how much information you want to receive, but usually at least, at, at the very least, you will get the um, class itself and maybe if you have any questions, please let me know. I would love to, to know if you have any questions on Escher, and maybe we can answer that right now. I don't really have any questions, but I wanted, I wanted to comment on one of the things you said about the lines uh, that you can see on his artwork. So the exhibition I went to, the Worlds of MC Escher, they had, they had quite a few of his originals on loan from the National Gallery of Art, and you can actually see them. Do you do see the lines? in his work. Yes, and, and what is very, what is great for all of us is that he made so many prints that there, whenever there is an exhibition of uh, Escher, 
even wherever it is in the world, you will probably see more than one original because, you know, the, he, they were able to, to send many of these and there is a, the, the official museum in Holland, but you can also see many of his original work in Rome. So you can see that this is like, this is uh, art that, that can travel very easily. And it's also art yeah. that many people go with, um, go to see, for example, with children, because it is so interesting and you can actually teach children so many things, not only of art history, but also the development of physics and mathematics and relativity and everything science. So you can actually wrap up a pretty good class uh, when you go to these museums and see them. But thank you. Yes, you, you actually can see the lines and sometimes you can see that he messed up some of them. Uh, so he was only human. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And even, I mean, you will receive, by the way, you will receive um, um, a print, uh, a printable version of a tessellation that I did. Trying to achieve a tessellation like freehand is very difficult. And, and you can see why he spent like months and months on, on the development of, of one. But yes, after the class, you will receive um, those that printable in your email. So thank you very much.